Okay, so thanks for coming, folks. Um, this is the second talk um, in the C-Search Spring series, though it's more summer than spring this year, um, on circular reefs. Um, so they're Galway's hidden gems. They're, they're mostly located in Galway. The first talk was a number of weeks ago, um, which was by Catherine Schoenrock, and it's available uh, on our YouTube channel. It's a, a um, seaweed identification workshop. So just a quick introduction to CSEARCH. So um, CSEARCH Ireland is a, a volunteer group of citizen scientists and divers and snorkelers um, collecting information on habitat and biodiversity around the coast of Ireland. Um, we, we do that by um, providing training um, to volunteers and then by, sorry, someone's got their, a sound on somewhere. Um, and then we have to uh, validate the data to um, make sure that when it goes into the National Biodiversity Data Center, it's as quality short as we can. And the purpose of this is to make sure that we can fill in the knowledge gaps and record changes in the marine environment. Um, so the whole idea is that when you have all of this information, you can then make um, um, informed decisions um, on management and conservation choices. So like, for example, maybe designating MPAs, which hopefully will happen in Ireland soon enough. So in terms of the pressures on the marine environment, I think anyone who spends any time in the marine environment will know things like overfishing, bycatch, damaging fishing gear, which I'll be talking about a lot later, pollution, invasive species, and um, litter, particularly plastic pollution. Uh, power generation and then climate change is obviously the big one, but I suppose there's not much sea search can do about that. Um, and then just what's obviously very topical at the moment is the Department of Housing, Local Government and Heritage are in somewhere in the middle of a consultancy process on the expansion of MPAs and the designation of MPAs. So there's no set criteria at the moment for what those will be, but likely to be some, similar to the SBAs and the SSEs, so threatened species or habitats, important species and habitats, representative features, areas of high biodiversity, which is something that divers obviously would be key to identify um, because people dive in, tend to dive in areas that have high biodiversity and then areas contributing to the maintenance of ecosystems. Um, in terms of specific species that are likely to be high on the agenda, eelgrass um, because it stores um, carbon and um, reef forming organisms. Um, so things like Maryland cipula um, and also kelp is, is obviously gonna be a big one as well. There's, there's obvious, uh, obvious potential um, in terms of sequestering carbon. So what happens when with your records when you submit them to Sea Search Ireland? Well, they go into the National Biodiversity Data Centre. Um, and this is a great um, feature because it, it makes them immediately available back to the recorders, but also it means that you can look and see how your records fit into the sort of national picture. Um, and then we, we also tend to run specific surveys as well. So, um, a number of years ago, someone identified that there was no records for Balmolish, so off we went to Balmolish and we got some records. Um, in terms of getting involved in Sea Search, um, we have our Observer course, which is a one-day course for divers and snorkelers, and it just basically teaches you how to record rather than going um, very in-depth into anything. Um, it's a one-day dry course, and then the following day, um, we'd have dives as part of that. Uh, and then there's a sea search surveyor, which is for experienced observers or for people who already have a background in marine science or something like that. It's much more intensive, filling out the forms is much more intensive, and it's it's quite a it's quite a heavy weekend um, in terms of doing the training, but it's well worth doing it. Then for groups in particular, um, we do an adopt a site scheme, which is it's 100 species and species groups, um, and it's used to track changes in the marine environment. But it, it's a set list of species. Um, and it's, a mu it's much easier to fill out. And then what we've been concentrating a lot more on in the last few years is specialized sea search projects. So the Sequila project is one of them, but we're also doing things like reef safari. We were involved with the Kelp Res project um, and we're just constantly trying to get our, our, our fingers into various pies. Um, and then in terms of submitting your records to sea search, um, we have the observer form, the paper and a PDF, surveyor form paper and PDF. The adopt a site form, we have a paper and Excel version and a PDF. And 
if you are just interested in recording just casual records, you can record those through uh, by directly through Biodiversity Ireland. But if you ever have any questions about recording in the marine environment, if you contact um, us on email or on Facebook, or you can find us through our website. Um, I will say though, um, so as good as is for people who aren't divers or snorkelers, and if you want to record in the marine environment, uh, Explore Your Shore, um, which is run through the National Biodiversity Data Centre, is the best place to, to start. Um, so just our contact details again, csearchallenge.e, Facebook, Instagram, or on email, and then all our videos, um, including this one, will be up on our YouTube channel. Okay, so... Um, you don't want to listen to me breathing. So what I'm going to be talking about today is uh, Serpula vermicularis, which is a small um, tube forming polychaete. But what's interesting with Serpula, as you can see here, is the tube, the larvae settle on existing tubes. So they grow up and up and up and up until you get these big reef-like structures. So Serpula um, is a biogenic reef. Um, so you can see here, there's sort of, there's little sort of interstitial spaces there for things. You have um, uh, Archidorus eggs on it. Um, and like that, if you go right down into the crevices, you can see there's um, squat lobsters and things living in it. So serpula reefs are, are effectively, they're a biogenic reef. So a biogenic reef is anything, uh, any sort of hard substrate that's created by a living thing. So an obvious example is something like marl. Um, a lot of the time when you see marl, you're, you're only sort of seeing patches on the surface. But if you, if you ever dive, um, like we did a few years ago down in Sneem, where you've got very thick marl beds, it's a real three-dimensional structure. Like if you were to pick up a, a handful of it, and you obviously place it back afterwards, is there's things living in the gaps in between the marl, underneath it, on top of it, everything. It, it's, it's a really, it, it's, a, it's functioning as a habitat in a, in a way that sort of individual pieces of marl sitting on top of a, a bed of seaweed don't. But even something like um, a mussel bed or a horse mussel bed would be, um, would be excellent examples. Is it, it provides a sort of 3D, 3D hab, habitat for species. Um, but you can see here from, um, an old photo from Killary Harbour, like when you get large um, chunks of reef side by side, on, uh, um, it does form a sort of continuous reef in, in the same way that something like the Great Barrier Reef would, just on a much smaller scale, um, and it's a lot colder to dive. But here again, you can see all of the tubes, uh, all of the uh, worm fans out, and you can see there's sponge, there's all sorts of things growing on them. Um, and again, this is from our study site letter catalog, but you can see it is patched around and it, it, it provides a habitat in addition to what you've sort of got going on in terms of the rocks uh, and the mud in between. And again, there you can see there's an awful lot of it in the site. So in terms of the global distribution of it, it's found at seven sites. I don't have one of them here because I don't understand enough Italian to figure out where exactly near Trento in Italy it is, but apparently it's in a lagoon in Italy as well. But you have two sites in Scotland, um, Loch Chacus and Loch Crairn. Um, and then it was previously in Black, Black South Bay, but that has largely been trawled out. I, I, I wouldn't hang my hat on there being a lot of it left. You have it in Killary Harbour, you have it in Salt Lake, and you have it in Letter Callow. The colours on this are, as far as I can find from the literature, the Loch Chacus stuff seems to be quite uh, in quite good shape. Letter Callow is in quite good shape as well. The Salt Lake, it's really hard to tell because the Salt Lake is a really weird site, and there, you could have a whole series of lectures just on what's going on in the Salt Lake. Um, but Killary Harbour, there's been an awful lot of damage in the last few years um, from dredging, similarly in Black South Bay. And when we dived in uh, La Crane in 2017, I think it was, what we saw there is very similar to what we're seeing now in Killary Harbour with, in terms of the damaged reefs and um, where it's dominated by brittle stars and things like that. So in terms of sort of ha classifying it as a habitat, um, the JNCC have a species list that they use to um, 
to identify a uh, spuna vermicularis habitat. So you can see um, the um, so in, in terms of the relative importance of, for defining it. So you have things like spuna vermicularis, green urchins, black brittle star, fluted sea squares, and um, queen scallops, and things like that. And um, So um, our colleague, uh, Catherine Schoenrock, um, who we worked on on the kelp res, also did some survey, uh, transect surveys in um, the Serpina vermicularis reefs. Now, what she was doing was slightly different um, because she was looking at the whole habitat, whereas they're just looking at their Serpina. So some of the things there, like a Cair Balata, that she would have seen would have been um, uh, Serpula reef um, adjacent rather than on there. But you can see a lot of the same things you get um, shredded carrot sponge, common starfish, uh, and a whole bunch of um, different sea squirts. So, just for people who, who mightn't be entirely aware, this is um, the, the green sea urchin that I was referring to, the uh, Acidella dispersa, the dirty sea squirt, the queen scallop, um, common starfish. Um, hermit crabs and a city menchula, and even actually you can see a bit of dendrodroa uh, grossularia, which I'll, I'll talk about in a minute there. But this is the acidia menchula that I, I refer to, the, the large red sea squirt in the middle. Um, but they were also seeing things like um, common whelks and green shore crabs um, are part of the JNCC classification. And um, similarly, um, uh, uh, Phycologus rubens, this uh, seaweed. So when, when you look at the JNCC species list and then you look at Kate's data, you can see that there's a number of species that the JNCC um, think are important in terms of classifying it as a habitat that we just don't get in letter callow. Now we do get green shore crabs, but um, like Kate didn't record them on uh, any of the transects she did. So they're obviously much rarer there than they are here. But there's a whole load of things like, I've never seen an antenna hydroid in there. Um, Kate's a, a seaweed expert. I think she'd have seen the sea beach if it was there. Don't tend to get a uh, dendroa on it. Um, and you don't tend to get a lot of um, brittle stars on healthy um, serpula. Well, or at least that would be my um, sort of anecdotal um, comment. And we certainly would very rarely see common whelks in there, um, which would be an easy species to identify. So, while there are similarities between the um, the Scottish reefs and the Irish reefs, there's an awful lot of differences. So in the Scottish reefs, and again in Killary now recently, what you'd see an awful lot here is in, um, in between the tubes, you'd see a sort of brittle stars sticking up, and they tend to be dominated by squirts, whereas in Lentercalo, it tends to be dominated by uh, sponges as the encrusting species. Um, now you can see here, you can see there are squirts um, growing in the middle, but Largely, it's just re, uh, worm tubes and um, uh, shredded card sponge. Now, what's interesting um, is, and I'll, I'll just touch on it very briefly, is again, this is anecdotal, but when we were in um, in Ukraine, is what we saw an awful lot of in around the um, Cipula were um, the long clawed um, uh, squat lobsters, so uh, pictured here. And I've, I've never seen them in Ireland. I think they may be more northerly in their distribution, um, but I, I'd have to defer to a, a Northern Irish diver on that. Um, whereas what we get is a lot of this, um, the Galateris uh, scumifirma, the um, olive squat lobster in the crevices. So you sort of get a difference like that. Um, but also um, at the site in Scotland and the at, in Killary Harbour, you get a lot of an awful lot of this guy, um, Pagaris uh, predux with the um, the cloak and enemy. So the similarities between the Scottish sites, there's some similarities between the Scottish sites and Killary Harbour, there's some similar similarities between Killary Harbour and Letter Callow, there's some similarities between Letter Callow and the Scottish sites. But it would sort of suggest that while it seems to be confined to a number of locations at the moment, it may be that it was previously more widespread and the areas that we're looking at now, both in Scotland and in Ireland, these are sort of refuges and actually it could occur in a lot more areas. It's just been destroyed because it is quite, um, it is quite brittle. So like I said, the three sites in Galway 
uh, Killary Harbour to Salt Lake and Leonard Cowell could not be more different in terms of their makeup. Black Salt Bay is a is a wide open bay. None of the three sites in Galway are that. And then it's in, in two sort of sea locks in Scotland. So while we'll never be able to go back and collect that data, unfortunately, um, historic data on Serpula would be what would probably totally change our view on its distribution patterns and stuff like that. And it's why it's very important to record now because who knows in 10 or 15 years time what the distribution pattern of any any given species and um, particularly with some with climate change down the line is and i doubt in terms of diving but you know at some point maybe serpula was so common that no one even thought to make note of it in their little bay but anyway enough about that so onto the actual project itself. So if you're looking for more details on the project, um, you can find it on our website. Um, I have the address there. The idea came from the Black Green Pot project, which uh, Matt Doggett ran in Dorset. Um, so Black Green come in to shallow waters to, uh, to breed, um, and they do it over a sort of a, a flat rock, rocky bed. So what they did was they put down GoPros, and um, recorded the uh, make guarding. Um, and we saw that, we thought that's really interesting. I wonder, can we do something like that? So in 2021, we applied for the National Parks and Wildlife Small Recorder Grant and um, we were successful. So this project um, is funded through the Department of Housing, um, Local Government and Heritage. And we're extremely grateful because while GoPros aren't as um, expensive as they used to be, they're not cheap either, and you obviously need a lot of spares and battery packs. So the setup is relatively simple. We've got a weight, we've got a, a camera um, in a housing, we've got a rope to keep the, the housing from um, from floating off. Now we haven't had to use those yet, thank God, but you know, better safe than sorry. And then we've got a transect line and we deploy four cameras at a time. So what we do is the support diver with the the support diver with the um, carry bag carries the four cameras and the other person lays out a 50 meter transect and then we push a camera at zero, at 10, at 20, at 30 and at 40 meters. Um, and then we go back and we turn them on. Sometimes we forget to do it in that order and you get lovely videos of people walking around. But that is, that's Tony, I think. Yeah, that's definitely Tony. And you can see him there with his four cameras and it's it's one of these things. It gets easier as you go along, but there there's a lot of health and there's a lot of health and safety uh, protocols done up for this. And while normally I'd be one to sum up poo poo health and safety, I'm glad we did them because it it mucking around with a bunch of cameras in the water is it's, it's far trickier than um, you think. But we are glad that we have the learnings from this, so that if someone was ever to do a similar project um, with Sea Search, um, we'd be able to. And um, we'd be able to tell them what we did wrong. So come along, deploy the camera near a, uh, a bit of a Jason Reap, turn it on, check to see that that red light is running, and then we get some video, like so. So you can see you, you um, have all of squat lobsters, but you can see if you look at the top and bottom, you can see sort of arms sticking out in various places. You, you can see at times the circular is reacting the stuff that goes in. And then, so, this, so these videos do jump there, they're not continuous. So then you get a lot of things that you get two spot gobies coming along. They tend to come by in shoals, but you do see them interacting with the reefs as well. Um, we're not sure, it's very hard to tell from that angle, are the two spots trying to predate or are they merely looking for a bit of food? Um, and I just put this section in as well, just to illustrate just how fast the marine environment can change in terms of the amount of light that's in there. So you can see sort of almost instantaneously, you can go from a sort of very murky um, uh, orangey um, level, light level to back to what we had at the start, the um, 
this isn't this isn't spliced that that's live so it just literally happens like that so there's a lot of dynamic um going on in the marine environment that aren't going on when you're doing um terrestrial recording like things can change very quickly right? um and a lot of the videos is we're just literally sitting there and not much is happening and you're trying to make sure you're paying attention and then <laughs> you get that and that that made me jump now the first time I, i'm sort of used to it at this stage but um yeah so you obviously get cormorants in using the um the uh the reefs for for fishing And then what we tend to see a lot of is this. So you have large ballon rafts, you have pollock, um, tend to just swim by. They don't tend to seem to interact with the reefs um, largely. And then you get gold tinnies are one of the most common species. So you can see the gold tinny there in sort of center shot um, with the black spot going around and it's having a bit of a nibble at the worms, seeing is there anything tasty to eat in there. But um, you can see from the video, like it, it is a, it's a, it's a functional 3D habitat. Like the, the fish are interacting with it. They're trying to have a nibble at, at the odd worm. They're probably in looking to see is there anything tasty to eat in between the gaps. Um, and yeah, just a, a lot of fish life, um, a lot of crustaceans. Um, and I, I suppose the one, drawback we have in terms of the project is that you don't have enough video to make sort of um, definitive comments on terms of behavior and stuff like that. But the, the other problem is that if we had more, um, um, if we had more videos, um, we'd have the problem that as a volunteer group, we'd, we'd have to uh, sift through all these videos. So at the moment, um, you have four cameras going in um, every month, that's eight, eight hours worth of video to go through. Which is um, quite considerable, but um, I, I find it I find it oddly soothing watching them. Uh, and there's another gold tinny again. So yeah, so gold tinnies tend to be the, the species that we record the most while doing this project. So in in terms of our species count of what we've seen so far, um, seen an awful lot of gold tinnies, uh, gobies in that they're quite hard to identify and again rasp because it, it can be hard to identify things in the videos uh two spots pollocks fish many and then ballon ras. you do get an awful lot of crustaceans using the reef but the problem is they tend to be um in the gaps in between it um and on top of it rather than um sort of out where they can be seen and identified so a lot of the time what you what you're seeing is you're seeing um the sort of the effect of them rather than um what they're actually up to. But I suppose the question some people ask is, is why is it important to deploy cameras? Why can't we just go in and do the transects? Um, and I suppose the, the video deployment probably shows this. So this isn't one of the better deployments, but there you go. Put the camera down, it's turned on. And you can see all of the tubes have withdrawn, all of the worms have withdrawn into their tubes. Now, again, they wouldn't react as badly if I was just um, swimming by or taking a photo. Um, obviously, made a bit of a pig's ear that one. But you can see, and this is speeded up by 10. You see, it takes an awful long time for the reef to um, come back to where it was before 
we deploy the camera. So this would be similar if, if we were in diving, if we were in doing transects, is um, you're not getting a clear, you, you know, as a diver, you are affecting the, um, the habitat you're, you're swimming over, the habitat you're seeing. So you are impacting on that. So it took about 300 seconds from when I deployed the camera to when, to th this shot here, when all the tubes are back out feeding again. Um, sorry, I thought I had more videos. I'm really flying through this. It's going to be a nice short, uh, nice short talk tonight. So I suppose the the next thing to talk about then are threats to the cipula. So um, static fishing gear is the only one we really have in Letter Callow. People throw the odd lobster pot in there. I don't know why. There's no crabs of any um, significant size, and there's certainly no lobsters. Uh, anchors a, a few years ago. Well, I say a few years ago, probably about ten years ago up in um, Killary, either an anchor either an anchor or a lobster pot. And if it was an anchor, it was an anchor from a small boat, had um, been dragged through the spewlet. Uh, it was about a metre and a half wide of a um, of a line just sort of towed right through the centre of it. Um, and then the big one that we're seeing in, in Killary at the moment is, is trawling. It's a, it's a bottom dredge gear. And that's also what did for Blacksaw Bay. This, this, these are... In Letter Callow, it's on rock, but in a lot of the other habitats, um, it's on mud. So you come in and you, and you dredge to it, you're just taking all the, the reef out. There's sort of dead reef left for it to settle, but you keep doing it continually and, and you, you remove that as well. Um, and then we're not sure where eutrophication and pollution would come in. It obviously has some level of an impact in Scotland because they're not, none of the other, um, threats seem to be there um, and theirs doesn't seem to be doing particularly well but it's hard to know like there's there's a fish farm in Killary that doesn't seem to be doing anything to the uh, didn't seem to be doing anything to the Zipula there it's mussel farms doesn't seem to be doing anything there's a fish farm not far from Metacallo again doesn't seem to be having any any impact um, and Salt Lake um, size is just too weird to, to make any definitive statements on that um, but just in terms of the damage, so this is um, at the site in Killary. So the video on the left is um, 2012, and then the video on the right is 2018 in approximately the same location. So you can see in the left, you've got big um, uh, reefs. They, they, they did tend to get to a much bigger size than um, what we see in Letter Callow. Um, in Letter Callow, it's on rocks rather than um, on mud. Um, whereas in Killary, it was always um, on old um, on old reefs growing up on the rocks. Whereas on the right there, what you've seen is you've seen a lot of dead. Um, uh, we've not a lot, lot knocked over. It's an awful lot of epiphytic stuff growing on us. Um, but uh, like I said, um, in the difference between the JNCC um, species list and what we were seeing and what Kate was saying is you've seen an awful lot more um, sea squirts and things like that growing on us. You can see brittle star legs waving out of us, um, which you can't see in the video on the left and which we all almost never see in, um, in Letter Callum. Um, and because I've referenced it a number of times, just this is um, the Salt Lake. So the Salt Lake is, is a really weird site in that it's a artificial lagoon. But as far as I know, someone did a PhD thesis on it before. And it before it was an artificial lagoon, it was a lagoon anyway. So the bridge just sort of happens to be there. But um, the tide goes out more than it comes in there. So um, you don't get, you, you just get weird stuff going on in there where stuff gets killed off. And it has periodic hypoxic events um, where everything in there dies below a certain depth. And then because you don't have a full um, open sea 
input, you don't get the species recolonizing in the same way they would. So what you can tend to get sometimes is, is you get species that you wouldn't normally consider a sort of a, a species that could dominate a whole habitat coming in and just uh, and just totally taking over. So you, you could come in and you could find the whole place is covered in light bulb sea squirts or something like that. So you get a real real boom and bust um, thing in there. But you can see there is cirpula, there's there's dead cirpula, there's live cirpula, but this video um, was taken during one of the epoxic events, but it, it's just a real example of like how dark and murky it is compared to the video I just showed you of old um, Killery and the videos from earlier of um, Larry Callow. But even just one of the one of the threats that, um, because of its its biology that. Um, Cirpula faces is you can um, you can see here just at the um, at the base here the, the massive structure and it's just it was just attached on by literally a handful of tubes onto the rock so eventually just the weight um, and probably just a, a storm wave took it over and, and the whole thing collapses now what you would hope to see if if it's hab if it's happy and healthy and recruiting is you'd uh, you'd see that that um sort of knocked over piece of reef would form the basis for um future uh growth so you'd get so you get the larvae settling on that and, and you get more growth coming out on the top of that but and like i said i, I thought i had more videos i thought this would be longer it's going to be a very short talk um we do have good news and i'll finish with the good news is you should have to see things like this. So that is um, from Letter Callow, and that's about as big and as hale and hearty as you're going to see. Cipula anywhere in Ireland. Um, it's Tony blinding me with his light. But um, yeah, it's just big, uh, big chunks of healthy reef uh, grown up on an artificial substrate. So that's a photo from the top. So you can see it's, I don't know what that is, it's some sort of fish cage. Um, but when we first started diving Letter Callow eight or nine years ago, um, um, there was, um, this by a box, um, I, if it was there, it certainly didn't have cipula growing on it to that extent because we, we hadn't even noticed it. So it, it the cipula is obviously is colonizing um, um, and taking over new habitat in the area, which it doesn't seem to be doing at some of the other sites. Some of the evidence from Scotland, um, there, there seems to be suggestions that maybe it goes through these sort of boom and bust cycles. But again, you're sort of extrapolating, it, it, same in Scotland as we're doing here, you're sort of extrapolating from the sites we have rather than from some, some sort of uh, quality baseline data to, to figure out what, what exactly is happening. Um, uh, and an interesting thought from um, the Scottish, one of the Scottish papers is that potentially this is something that can be transplanted. So, um, like I said, the, uh, at the site in uh, Letter Callow, it seems to be hale and hearty, it seems to be recruiting, we're getting fresh growth, it's growing on rocks, it's doing well. Um, but in this paper, what they effectively does, did was just took a bit of reef in a bucket, and put the bucket um, at another site, and it seemed to survive. It, it didn't It didn't do particularly well, it didn't fl flourish, but um, it was a fairly rough and ready experiment. You, you would suggest that if, if more care was taken, perhaps um, you'd be able to do better in terms of uh, transplant experiments. So I think that's that's me done. Um, so just to reiterate, um, you can find all the details of the Cipula project on our website. Um, if you want any more information, if you contact us on our, um, you can email us um, ccgerland.gmail.com. We do a monthly-ish newsletter that you can sign up um, for. Um, and then we're on Facebook and Instagram. I'll thank our um, our funders in the Department of Housing and, like I said, uh, oh, and um, the Marine Conservation Society. 
um, who run the, the actual sea search program that we're part of. But I, I always like to finish with a shout out to the National Biodiversity Data Center because, um, like I said, they, they host their data and they, um, they map our data. And that's not something we'd be able to do. If you didn't have that resource, we would just be putting all these records in a filing cabinet somewhere and they'd be getting locked away and they'd never be getting, um, they'd never be getting used. So, uh, yeah, I'll finish up there. So if there's any questions, um, I'll take those now.